This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. our final class in our mini medical series, Life in Balance, Strategies for Optimal Health um, from the Science of Integrative Medicine. Uh, we started out talking about how we have to have our lives in balance and that this will enhance our quality of life, our vibrancy, and our mental and physical fitness. And I, I'm so pleased to have learned that some of you have made some changes that have actually changed BMI uh, your body mass index and other things, which is absolutely great. Because we know that a life in balance will promote health and it will help prevent illness. And lifestyle choices can also help us bring balance, I think, to so much more of our lives. And But it, what it does, though, in order to maintain balance is you have to do something very active all the time, just like a person walking on a tightrope. It requires constant monitoring of what's going on. Uh, and I forgot to introduce myself, so I'll do that now. My name is Margaret Chesney. I'm the director of the UCSF Osher Center, which sponsored this series. And I've been so proud to be able to um, introduce each of the other speakers uh, because they were all so exceptional. And then to be able to sit and hear what they had to share. Uh, we had Dr. Ellen Hughes, Dr. Steve Bent, Dr. Alyssa Eppel, uh, Dr. Daphne Miller speaking about... Um, our diets just before Thanksgiving. Uh, Dr. David Becker last week talking to us about health and families. And for each of these speakers, I've taken home these nuggets of information that um, I didn't know before, which has just been so precious. So tonight, I will be, I don't have anyone to introduce me, so, but, but I'm going to make that very, very brief. I'm going to be talking about managing stress, building your own resilience, and bringing balance into your life. And as I can, I'll try to weave in some of the lessons that we've learned um, in the previous lectures. And those of you who've come in since we started, I do have some pedometers up here. So when I finish the lecture, please, please come up and I'll give you the pedometers that I promised at the end of the first lecture that we would have. And it was Ellen Hughes who started out talking about how important it is to get exercise so the pedometer is something that you can wear on your body. They're very fun and lightweight. And she had said, let me see if anybody remembers, how many steps are sort of optimal to maintain 10,000 steps? And what is amazing is to discover how so many of us think we've had an active day, and then you look down and you don't have your 10,000 <laughs> steps. And no fair taking the pedometer out and just shaking it a bunch of times. <laughs> Not supposed to do that. Uh, but I think also the pedometer, I'm hoping, will help you remember the course and also sort of begin, this is a, you're beginning, these steps are steps since the course, so steps toward a new, healthier life for all of us. Uh, my name, as you know, is Margaret Chesney. I'm a professor here of medicine at UCSF. I was here, I first came to UCSF in 1987 and worked for uh, quite a few years on the AIDS epidemic. I'm a behavioral scientist. I have a degree in clinical psychology. But my focus has always been on behavior and health and how could we use our minds to lead healthier lives. And that's always been my focus. I came to UCSF um, after being at Stanford for 10 years. A friend called me and um, asked me to come help. He said we had this incredible epidemic, of course I knew living at Stanford, um, with HIV AIDS. And he, he said, look, I just need your help right now. We think we could maybe get people to change their behavior and by doing so that they could lower their risk for um, contracting the infection. Um, I was also very interested in helping people manage stress. And we knew that being infected with HIV was incredibly stressful. And it's rarely in your life that 
a dear friend says, I need help. And I thought there for a while, I thought, and I had a great job, and I just said, you know, I need to do this. I, years ago, I'd heard the statement that if you're not part of the solution, you're part of the problem. And it, that just sort of came into my mind. It came, you know, where did it come from? But this thought just came in, and I just made this switch. I came here, then I went back east for a few years learning more about health policy, ended up at NIH, the National Institutes of Health, and was the deputy director that funded a lot of the work in integrative medicine. And I did that for about a year, and I was only going to do it for three years and then come back to UCSF. I was on what we call leave. And I was on leave, and uh, unfortunately, my boss, the director of NCAM, they fund a lot of the science that you've been hearing about, he, can, he developed a glioblastoma, which is a really bad brain tumor uh, that right now, you know, heretofore is pr usually in almost, you know, 99% of the cases fatal. And he asked me to stay. So I stayed until he'd finished that journey. And it was remarkable because I was the deputy director, but he was out most of the next two or three years that I was there. So most of the time I was what we call the acting director. And the National Institutes of Health knew I was new. So they kind of came around knowing that, knowing that I'd be under tremendous stress being new in this position, having a budget of about $128 million to dispense and wanting to do it all just right. And, um, they really supported me and helped me. The top people, these were the top people in infectious disease, the person who funds all the AIDS work became a really good friend because they all liked Steve so much. And we rallied together and um, helped Steve through those, that you know, last part of his life. And they helped me sort of keep it all together. And then it was my focus became, how do I get back to UCSF, never dreaming that um, the director of the Osher Center would decide about that time that she wanted to retire. So I, you know, it was sort of a dream come true. I applied for the job. There were about 200 candidates, and I got very lucky, and that brought me here today to talk with you and the chance to put together this mini medical series. So we're going to talk about new strategies for managing stress, building resilience, and bringing balance to our lives. And. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to make the case. It's a new strategy, and that is that there are pathways by which positive emotions uh, influence our health and well-being. And I'm also going to argue that positive emotions are not just the absence of negative emotions. That's what everyone thought until a few, actually it was a few years ago that Susan Folkman and I did some research on this, and it, lo and behold, to our surprise, we discovered that being happy wasn't the opposite of just being sad. Uh, can positive emotional states be increased and maintained? I'll answer that question. And then I'm going to give you some tools that you can use to maybe increase the positives in your life. Uh, first, let's make the case. And I'm going to start with something that's more familiar to all of us. And it's really where we always were with stress. The, most of the research on stress would focus on the negative. And why is that? Because early in medicine, way before we had genome projects and all these kinds of things, medicine was the search to try to figure out what was wrong with the individual and eliminate it. Like there was something had taken over a person and we have to get rid of it. And so you see this in early medicine. Uh, repelling spirits by shamans. The alchemist was trying to put together some sort of a potion or elixir to flush the system. It's even part of some of the medicines today, like Ayurveda, this idea of like, you know, these elimination diets. So it's still, some of this, there's probably in every one of these folk, you know, medicines, there's always some good truth. Uh, Hippocrates had come up with these four humors, and many diseases were thought to result from negative emotions, he actually was right about that because 70% of doctor visits are related to stress. So Hippocrates was right. And he thought it was because there was some sort of imbalance among the humors. So this idea of life imbalance goes way back, way, way back to him. Um, Mind-body research has focused on negative affect. And in fact, I wanted you to all know about that because Negative affect really does indeed affect our health. As I just said, 70% of office visits 
People with um, high levels of stress have two and a half times the likelihood of developing heart disease. This is absolutely true of both genders, but particularly true of men, probably because we have more research on that. But this is a really hot topic. You see it coming up all the time, negative affect, stress, the blues, you know, just being really, really distressed and upset. And there's tons of research on this. And I'll foreshadow something. As I started getting interested in positive affect, you go to the health literature, and there's and now there is research. But before that, there was absolutely like nothing. Mental health. There, it's, we don't define what is mental health. We talk about aberrations from mental health, but what is health? And even the um, the uh, United Nations has begun, and the you know the World Health Organization has now started to say, you know, positive health is not the absence of illness. That be positive and to have be a healthy person is not just being neutral, but is being above neutral. It's having resilience, less vulnerability to disease, and we need to learn a lot more about that. But the way, one thing we know a lot about is the negative side. So I'll start with the negative side, and then we'll turn it around. What is stress? Now, so, you might say to me, you know, I like stress. I think stress accounts for me getting a lot done. And I'm going to say, as Alyssa alluded to, there is some forms of good stress. And what defines good versus bad? Good stress is when, yes, we all perceive stress or challenge, like it was a challenge to get here tonight because they're doing something special in Golden Gate Park. And I started to experience a little bit of, oh, I'm not going to get there. This is not good. Then I thought, well, just stay calm. I know the way there. I can think of other ways. For me, it was a challenge. It did. I perceived it, but it didn't exceed my ability to respond. I emailed Matt carefully so nobody could see at a stoplight, I admit, um, that I was on my way, don't worry. Um, but it didn't exceed my uh, resources. And I would say this is true of the Giants. Yes, we all went through this this fall. It's something we experience. Every time I think of the Giants in the World Series, I'll think of our classes where you know the people in the back were signaling me if they were winning. Um, the Giants, <laughs> they say you know that um, any given team can win on any given night. And in truth, I think the odds were that the Giants wouldn't win the World Series. But of course, those odds changed over time. But they knew that they had a chance. So to them, it was a positive challenge. And every one of those gentlemen will always remember that night as one of the best of their lives. And that's why it's sometimes fun you know, to watch things like the Academy Awards, because you get to sort of watch people at the one moment that they will remember forever and ever, that's very special. And notice no one, or it's, at least it's very rare, I've never seen it, has had a heart attack when taking, getting an award. It doesn't seem to happen. So that tells you something. OK, that's good stress. What's bad stress? Bad stress is the inverse of that. It is where you perceive stress, and it really does outstrip what you can manage. It's too much. And um, it, you look, and this is also exacerbated if the consequences of not being able to succeed are significant. So it could be work, where you finally just say, I just can't do this. I could stay up three nights and days. I could do, you know, sometimes remember in finals, you think if I pull an all nighter, I can still do the test. But there, what we're seeing with people now is that the sources of stress are piling on. So that there's work stress. Right now, there's a great deal of financial stress with foreclosures and so forth. There are social stress with um, you know, relationships, divorce, child custody. There's people we care deeply about who become ill. And these kinds of stressors, financial, job, family, and illness, what happens is they start to pile on. And it can be really become you know, a source that's really beyond a person's ability to cope. Now, negative affect, what do we usually mean by that? Because that's sort of a fancy term. It's anger, usually is one of the main areas. And anger is important because it turned out, I, one of my earlier areas of research when I was at Stanford, we were trying to understand what was it about type A behavior that was associated with heart disease. And it turned out it wasn't talking fast, which is good, <laughs> thank goodness. Um, <laughs> it's more a sense of impatience and being sort of irritated if people slow you down. It's a, it's a hostile competitiveness. It's like driving through traffic and saying, why are all these people in my way? And there's some anger about those cars and getting on the horn and honking. Um, instead of other people who are a little bit 
uh, you know, stressed out because the car behind them seems to be getting really close, and you don't know why they would be doing that. You know, maybe they're really close because they want to read the license plates. You know, they, they think I have a cute bumper sticker. Why are they doing that? They think I'm looking in the rearview mirror. We actually we did this study, some qualitative interviews, and people who really drive slowly also tend not to look in the rearview mirror, so they don't even notice the flashing lights. Um, anger is a negative affect. Another one is depression, very different. Depression, uh, anger arises in situations where people feel it's unjust and when they're not in control. Another one is uh, depression, which is, tends to be more of a loss, loss of reinforcement, certainly loss of people. These are important emotions. They're important. They're part of our, our human fiber. You need them. You know, we, there, there's, I would never tell anyone, don't be angry, because there are things that one needs to be angry about. It's, what I would recommend is that we don't relive those events over and over and to try to find ways to kind of dispel the anger, or to, to you look at it and you say, yes, it's making me really irritated, but I don't want it to get into my cardiovascular system. And I know, I, th I always think of a tray with a hypodermic needle with adrenaline on it, and I have to decide, and it's up to me, do I want to take that hypodermic needle, inject it into my heart, and basically cause my blood pressure and heart rate to go up? Do I really want to do that, or is it not that important? But I, ch I make a choice about those. And we all have that choice to pause for a moment and decide. Depression is real and r loss is incredibly painful. And we'll talk a little bit how to handle that. But these are important because they're, you know, life, part of living is living the full range of emotions and being able to experience them and being able to use them to motivate us to make change, to motivate us to live better lives. Uh, one of, a lot of research has focused on how do negative emotions get into the skin. You know, what, and so one thing we often like to look at is, well, are these negative emotions associated with, with you know, problems with health? And the truth is they are. And for example, there's the religious order study, the longitudinal study, 851 clergy, and they studied them. And the, the clergy you know, often have to hold their feelings in. They are like sponges. They hear everything that's happening to everyone. And then sometimes it's, they, they tend to kind of keep some of those feelings in. So they looked at suppressed anger and depression. And they found that doing that, feeling those feelings but not expressing them and kind of dealing with them, was associated with increased death rates over four years that was independent of other risk factors. Um, and I'll also give you some data on the opposite, what happens if you don't do that. Uh, the, there's some wonderful women's health study data. The Women's Health Initiative is well known. Does anybody know what for? That was the, exactly that was the the study that showed that um, taking Premarin or estrogen replacement might increase risk for um, both heart disease and breast cancer. But in part of that study, uh, many of us who worked on it, we included a whole bunch of other questionnaires because we knew it would be an incredible time to get information on 107,000 women, you know, on um, all kinds of things. And that data has now been posted on the web so other investigators can use it like a huge library of information. So a colleague of mine, Tyndall, looked at, we had some scales on being cynical and hostile, and they showed that women who had that attitude it was a longitudinal study, so the people filled out questionnaires at the beginning of the study, and then you can just look to see is it associated with a higher mortality rate. And it was. The more hostile women had 63 deaths per 10,000, and they'll be able to continue to follow the women and continue to confirm this. Uh, least hostile women lived um, longer lives. These were all women in adult years. Uh, and later I'll tell you about women that scored high in optimism. Uh, we want to understand more about how, as I said, this, this, now that we know it, it you know, is associated with mortality, you want to know why, what's going on. And this does get a little bit complicated because there are three, at least three pathways. One is physiological, one is behavioral, and one is, involves actually adverse, um, aversive environments. And I'll only highlight one of those. The physiological responses, you heard a lot about this um, when you heard from Alyssa Eppel. Uh, basically, negative emotions really have a cascading effect on our bodies. Why is this? Well, it, it, the part of our whole emo emotional nature was structured so that we would engage in the behaviors that we would, would help us survive. 
And so fear, flight, fight, all of those, if you think about ancient males and females, if there was a tiger, they had to have its whole cardiovascular arousal so that they could run away from the, the lion, run to the cave, get other people, come back, see if they could fight the lion or the mammoth. They needed meat. They needed to be able to hunt. They needed to be able to protect their families. They had to have the emotion to protect. So then if something harms your family or you lose a family member, then you can feel lost and sad or angry, but that emotion then spurs one to protect the family member. Members. I mean, all of this makes sense if you think about ancient man. And so the, uh, the fight, flight, and freeze responses are channeled through, you know, the brain perceives an event, it triggers a whole cascading set of, of um, outcomes. For example, to fight, what you have to have is the musculoskeletal system to fight, you've got to get blood flow to the muscles. But if you have too much stress, you end up with headaches, muscle pain. Respiratory, we know now that negative affect is associated with outbreaks, not of asthma being caused, but problems with asthma. It can exacerbate asthma. Um, it, it's related to hyperventilation, which can be associated with certain forms of anxiety and panic attacks. I've mentioned heart disease and so forth. Alyssa um, Eppel, in her earlier lecture, and those who've missed it, it'll be on UCTV, she talked a lot about cortisol, epinephrine, and how these various um, chemical responses in our bodies all interact in ways that are, um, can increase our risk. Um, the GI system, you can develop acid reflux. Um, you know, stomach pain based, in, based on uh, the stress in our lives. And it can affect the even reproduction. People under a great deal of stress are often have more trouble reproducing. Women skip their periods and so forth. So these are incredibly important systems. Negative and positive states, interestingly, are even associated. You can look at fMRI and PET scans. And it's interesting, you can find the states on the brain. The negative affect occurs more on the right frontal lobe. So if you can activate people's anger, the right frontal lobe lights up. If it's positive affect, the left frontal lo lobe will light up more. So there's the brain is perceiving this. The, it, it picks it up, and then it starts through the brain, sending all these signals down. Uh, the states... Um, like depression in particular, you can actually see this, and it allows us to do much more studies. Before, we only had questionnaires, and now we can actually you know, have a window. We've gotten into the black box, if you will, with these new tools. Uh, there have been some studies that then would study people who are showing negative affect and then look at their physiology to see what's going on. And they have lower NK cell activity. That's natural killer cell. That means they're white blood cells. That means if you have a little bit of an infection or something and a person has a lot of negative affect, they're more likely to, you know, that if you're exposed to a virus, they'll get the infection. Their natural killer cells are supposed to be floating around and basically eliminating uh, viruses, bacteria, and so <laughs> forth. Their immune systems are not functioning as well. They also have greater decreases in NK function during a stress, um, of, of, during the natural stress of the exam. You, their NK cells, you want to see them kind of like mount, and they're just they're, and to be able to um, respond in a way that makes sense with whatever's going on. They show a lot of abnormalities. They also, when you show a positive film, what you want to see is the NK cells, res the immune system responding to the positive, which we, we'd we like to see, and with positive people it does, so positive affect enhances immune function for negative people. They Even if you show the positive, they don't, it doesn't seem to impact them. And they don't, and, and they've actually then exposed them to vaccines to see, does their body mount the response you want to see to a vaccine, and they don't do as well. So a lot of indications that negative affect is not good. And Alyssa highlighted a number of other things, including the HPA access. Remember, she talked about the cortisol as the stress hormone. She outlined all of that, and we'll return to one of her slides in just a minute. What makes this tough to study is while all that physiological stuff is going on, and a lot of it's direct, the mood happens and the body responds, people respond to negative affect and try to do things to help manage it. And unfortunately, the things that they do are often um, 
adverse for their health as well. So you've got two things happening at the same time, which makes this a challenge to study. Depression is associated with poor health behaviors. Uh, people tend to drink more. The alcohol use is probably functional. They're trying to sort of become anesthetized, you know, make it easier. I won't ask for a show of hands, but in our society sometimes you sort of just, you know, some people will say, I just, I just need a drink. I want this to go away for a while. I just want to get away from this. So we notice that people in our society, they get up. What do they do to wake up? Coffee. What do they do when they go home? A glass of wine. Everything in moderation is okay. Uh, there have been tons of studies on caffeine. A little bit of coffee is probably not a problem for most of us. Uh, one glass of wine probably is a good idea. It's the excess. Uh, but we find, too, that depressed people exercise less. And remember, exercise actually enhances positive affect. They're doing less of that. And they also tend not to adhere to care. This is something we saw in the HIV epidemic. To such a proportion that you would put people in coping effectiveness groups. At the end of the study, I'll share with you some of the data where we were trying to enhance and help people cope with HIV in part so they'd have better quality of life, but also so that they would take the medication. Um, these behaviors then potentiate all the things that are happening physiologically at the same time. And then I think I've got this slide from Alyssa. Remember, she shared this, and she showed how stress and diet were working together to um, promote abdominal flat fat. And she showed that when you put stress with junk food, you, got higher, you, you would actually get this exponential impact of cortisol, insulin, um, and then the NPY, which I don't remember, greater abdominal fat. Remember, she talked about the soup the metabolic bad soup that occurs. Um, um, and it, she showed that in some of her studies that you know if you push this in some animal studies, they could actually create the metabolic syndrome in just four months. And so she, her summary slide that she had was how stress gets under the skin. It affects gene expression. If you remember, she talked about how it, it affected the rate of our telomeres shortening. Those are the little caps at the end of our chromosomes. Um, and she also highlighted how it changed our metabolic health, creating this stress soup. And she argued all of this is under our control because we can control what we eat, less sugars, and we can um, also you know, change some of our other behaviors to manage stress. And we promised you if you went to that lecture, you'd hear more about that tonight. So the third pathway, and these same pathways work for positive, but it's all turned around, is social isolation. This is kind of, I find this interesting, in that people who are feeling negative and distressed tend to be more isolated. And the isolation, again, has physiological pathways. So you'll see the cortisol appearing again. Depression increases cortisol. Isolation, even independent of depression, increases cortisol. Cortisol is the thing that's, that Alyssa talked about as getting mixed in with what we eat. So in, um, this is a study in Whitehall, which is the civil service workers in the UK. Um, and they took 188 healthy men, 110 healthy women, and they actually studied them and they used a close person questionnaire asking people how many friends do you have do you have someone with whom you could you know to whom you could say could you loan me money you know i need some help things like that how many people that they had close in their lives and they found that socially isolated men and women had higher waking cortisol which suggests that it's kind of carrying over day to day and greater cortisol output during the day so they're more alone in their lives. There are lots of studies. It's, I have to kind of pick my favorite ones to include. And Red Williams, Redford Williams, who does a lot of work on anger and heart disease, found this finding some years ago. And I, it's really interesting. He studied people who had had coronary artery disease. And then they followed them. And they found that people who um, they looked at five-year survival rates. And people who had basically no one, they were either unmarried, um, and they had, they, or, and and they had no confidant. And it was one question: like, do you have someone with whom you can talk about your deepest, you know, concerns and fears? Something like that. It was one person to really talk to. People who said no, 
and they took those people, they took the people that were not married, and they studied them, and they had a significantly greater increase. The Cox had three times the likelihood of dying, and they did go in and check to make sure that it wasn't because they had a heart attack and no one else was there. It's this, being alone is an unhealthy state for people, men and women, uh, both. Uh, so I promise I'm going to talk about the positive. There's tons of research on the negative, and as I indicated, practically nothing on the positive, but there's been a lot in the last, I would say, five to six years. It's sort of, you know, it's the, everything has its kind of day in the sun, and this is, you know, it was kind of fun to be at the beginning of this because it's had its day in the sun. But the question is first, what is the impact on health? And then I'll talk a little bit about how to intervene. So before, remember it said negative affect, adverse health outcomes. Now, what about being positive? It turns out, now, not that we always go to religious <laughs> populations, but this is a great study. These little nuns, <laughs> they filled out when they, these 180 Catholic nuns, years and years ago, filled out why they wanted to be nuns. And then um, these were autobiographies, and I guess that, you know, and then they all became nuns, and they, um, looked at these these were all written when they were 22 when they entered the convent they scored them for their emotional content like were they becoming nuns because they felt terribly guilty about something that had happened and they just felt that they needed to spend their entire life working that through or did it have a different association for them and then they looked at their survival in the group that is now between 75 and 85 years of age these ladies are really healthy too which is you know sort of amazing the ones that have survived and what they found um, here's an example of a nun, a nun with low positive emotion I was born uh, the eldest of seven children, five girls and two boys. My candidate year was spent in the mother house. I intend to do my best, blah, blah, blah. It's not really high in positive emotion. Here's high positive emotion. God started my life off well by bestowing upon me a grace of inestimable value. The past year, which I've spent as a candidate studying at Notre Dame College, has been a very happy one. Now I look forward with eager joy. I mean, there's a difference between the two. So did it matter? Yes, it mattered. Uh, but they found was positive emotional content predicted survival six decades later. So something people wrote when they were 22 predicting survival decades later because these, these tend to be uh, qualities that are part of our persons. And if you know children as they're growing up, you know, there are some qualities. Children do have kind of tendencies. And then the question becomes, can you change this? Uh, Danner, who did this work, concluded finding, and this was one of the early studies to sort of point out, gee, there's something about these positive people. It's finding such a strong association of written positive emotional expression to longevity indicates a need for research that shed lights on the underlying mechanisms. How is it that positive mood gets into our body? Why would it change, you know, our, our health histories? Remember, I promised you, you know, the Women's Health Initiative finding. You know, I showed you before that those women that had higher scores in hostility were more likely to have passed away in the follow-up period. It turns out the same number of women they watched, they looked at them over the eight years. Optimists had 46 deaths per 10,000, pessimists 64. And there is an optimism scale. It's called the life orientation test. It's sort of, are you still trying to say, look, we're going to pull through this. Got to be, you know, let's look at the bright side. We're going to try to figure out what to do here. Um, Obama has been interesting as you watch him during this trying to compromise thing. I'm watching it not from a political standpoint, but seeing him you know, trying to look and, you know, look to the future and say, how can I make this work? Because he's president for, at, you know, at least two more years, and he wants to do everything he can for the country. I actually saw Bill Clinton last night, just, uh, I was at an event where they said, you know, you, would you like to hear Bill Clinton? <laughs> yes. I, you know, it was interesting. Um, and he is incredibly optimistic. And when um, the person who was interviewing him late in the program sort of came to the end and said, you know, how do you, you know, knowing all that you know about global health, knowing, I mean, so doing all this work on trying to get, um, you know, the Haitians, and then he was over with the big, the tsunami, and, and he's trying to get drugs for the children in Africa, and he's so close to all of this, and trying to raise funds to provide care. And 
it was, it was how do you how do you handle being so close to all of that? And he went into this incredible. I wish I'm going to try to see if I can capture that part of a YouTube and I would show it because he just sort of started to glow. And right before him, Stevie Wonder had spoken because Clinton was late, and so they brought they found Steve, they went out and found Stevie Wonder, and he said the same thing. And I had just given a lecture that afternoon, so people came up to me and said, "Did you know they were going to say that?" But they both said that this is what. You know, Stevie Wonder has a different way of looking at life because he never saw uh, colors of people. So he has a very different um, perspective. But both of them, it was interesting, came to this optimism that it's the only way to go, which was amazing. So psychological well-being and mortality, there just been, there's now been, they took all the studies. This was done in 2008. They found 35 studies where this was sort of embedded. And they said, look, is there anything, is there any there there? Do these studies really show anything? So they looked at studies that had healthy populations, and they looked at them longitudinally. Does being positive make a difference? And out of the 35 studies, they found significant associations across so many of them. They said, oh my heavens. And this was actually done by a colleague of mine who thought this was a little silly. And, he, and I said, go to it, you know, do that. And he called me and he said, you won't believe what we found. And he had dug up studies that hadn't been published. It was really incredible. And there were another 35, that was just by chance, studies with, you know, looking at heart disease and so forth. So the news is there must be something here. So what are the mechanisms? Let's start to look. Uh, immune function. They looked at positive affect and immune function, a study in 2001, they followed faculty at a university. And they did an affect scale at the beginning of the year. And then they just followed them to see how many colds they got. And if you got a cold, you were supposed to report, and I got a cold. And they found that the people who had higher scores on positive affect had fewer colds. And they got it published. Any of you could do a study. This is easy. Um, then they also looked at positive emotional, another person looked at positive emotional style and looked at the risk of catching cold. There was a study, oh, 394 people in England, healthy adults, were put in the common cold unit in Salisbury, England for two and a half weeks or something, they had to live in this place. And they were all healthy when they went in. And they studied them, and they were only looking at stress. So Sheldon Cohen, in 1991 or something, looked at his data, and he proved that people who, when they went in, they all went in healthy. And after they were there for a while, and they established that they were healthy, they dropped rhinovirus down their nose. So you knew exactly when they got infected. It's like flying on an airplane. When you sit by someone who's sick, you know exactly when you were infected. Because most of us, by the time we get on a plane, are stressed out. Either it's by you know, having to go through the scanners or getting ready for the trip or the jet lag and all that combination of stuff. People are a little bit stressed when they either are coming back or going on vacation and because of all the changes. And then you get exposed to a cold, and that's that. Um, well, anyway, they did this study. So in 1991, Sheldon Cohen got this great paper published in the New England Journal of Medicine, the best journal, because he showed that the ratings they gave of stress was significantly associated. Those who rated stress um, low, even though the virus was dropped into their nose, only 27% got a cold. Rate the stress high, coming in, you're healthy, rhinovirus dropped in your nose, 50% got the cold. So not everybody gets it. So that's the part about the resilience. OK. Sheldon comes to one of these lectures. In fact, it's one that's a lot like you're hearing that I gave. And he said, you know what? I have the data in that study. I said, Sheldon, go look at your data. So he goes and looks at his data. There were some questions he could kind of tease out that were positive. And lo and behold, in the same old data, the positive predicted not getting infected. Um, I'm going to, this is another one um, that it's the flip side of what I showed before about the social isolation. They did a lot of this with this one cohort. They looked at those who rated on a happiness scale. They had them carry little Palm Pilot things. And every, every they would be beeped. And then they would have to do their little ratings. Are you happy? You know, how are you doing? Is life good? And they found that happiness was related to all the good things. Heart rate's lower, cortisol. Uh, plasma fibrinogen is how sticky your blood is and tendency, tending to clot and stuff. So it's physiologically lots of indications that positive affect is a, kind of the flip side of the negative. Health behaviors. What about people that are probably so happy they don't even need to worry about these things? Well, it turns out 
people who have positive affect are more likely to engage in physical activity. They um, are less likely to smoke. They are less likely, uh, they, they actually have reduced alcohol intake. They drink just like everyone else, but less. And they, ha they tend to have healthier diets. Makes studying people hard because you want them to you know, do all the bad diets so we can just look at the cortisol. Or you wanna, it's really hard because the, all of these things are clustering. What about social support? Now remember, we've got studies, and there are studies too, that show that unfortunately depressed people tend not to get social support. Well, guess what? People who report positive emotions receive more social support. And this may become very, very important in understanding what happens when you can include, increase people's positive affect. Um, positive affect is directly associated with the number of people who were able to provide, who helped people over a 12-month period. So if you're, in a, you're a person who's positive, you're more likely to have a bigger network, more people in that network are helping you, they're supporting you, you're interacting with them. So it's like everything is going in one direction. So... I, I mentioned that I would do a couple things tonight. I'm going to talk about that positive is not the opposite of negative, and this is important. Susan Folkman and um, I was one of her colleagues in this study, we were really struck by um, looking at positive affect now and, and understanding how it related to negative affect. Let me tell you how this came to pass, because we didn't even look at this right away. We were working with people with HIV AIDS, and we had two parallel studies. My study was looking at interventions to help them manage AIDS. Susan had a study looking at bereavement. And she was looking at persons who were caregivers of a person with HIV. These were gay couples. So she had a person who has HIV. And she was not studying that person. She's studying the caregiver of someone who's very sick with AIDS. And we had to find people where we, this is before they had the medications that work well. So the study was done when you could pretty much predict that a person with a certain level of CD4 count would probably die in a specific length of time. It's kind of a tough study to do. And so we were looking at caregivers that we knew that during the course of the five-year study, they would become bereaved. They knew it. We knew it. Everyone knew this because there wasn't a cure. And we looked at caregivers both who had HIV and caregivers who did not have HIV. You can imagine the strain. If you have the disease that your, your partner or the person you're caring for also has, and you're watching your partner die, and you have it as well. And so we were studying these people, and we had these, these wonderful men, and we had these incredibly long questionnaires. And I was working with Susan one day, and a couple of the participants came in and told us that they were upset with us. And they'd filled out our questionnaires, but they wanted to talk with us. And we said, you know, t you know we, we, what, what is it? And they said, you are missing the boat. And we said, what do you mean? And they said, ever since I've had AIDS, I have never lived my life so much to the fullest as I do now. I don't miss a sunset. Um, we knew people, they said, my friend is going off to Italy. He studied Italian. He wanted to speak Italian when he got there. Even though, you know, I don't miss, when it rains, I go out and stand there because I can feel the rain. And you guys don't ask us about this. You're not asking us about the, how important it is to be alive. We know, you know, and they'd say, I used to do drugs. I used to do this. I'm volunteering now. You know, I work in this place. I'm doing this. You know, I'm helping out at hospice. I'm living every single day. When I wake up, it's, a, it's my birthday. I'm still here. And it was like, oh, my Lord. You know, we, we, just, we had just so assumed that being, so, oh, back to the drawing board. So we went all the way through our data, and we found all the questions that were on positive affect and negative affect. We initially started by just looking at people who reported low levels of depression. And then we found that these things were not related, that you could be depressed, you can be very sad, like, I'm sad that, um, you, know, um, that some, you know, Elizabeth died a few days ago. Elizabeth Edwards died. I don't know her, but, you know, I'm just sad that she, that was, a, she was a, you know, really brave woman. And she talked to a lot of us about taking care of our bodies. She talked about women's health a lot and talked about getting mammograms and all that, and she's passed away. So I'm sad about that. And um, at the same time, 
I'm really happy that you're all here. And we're, you know, I gave you pedometers and we're gonna be different people after having this experience together. So I can have both of those affects at the same time. And that's what we found, that you could report high levels of both positive and negative affect. Um, we found that they co coexist. And this is from Susan's study, that positive affect and finding meaning during caregiving was associated with more rapid recovery after bereavement. Everybody, when they lost their partner, maxed out in bereavement. No, it's, it's just devastating to lose people that are close to you. And it was amazing. There was no figure graph high enough to capture how every single person felt. There was no variation in that. We are meant to care for one another, and when we lose one another, it's devastating. But what we did see is the trajectory after that was, which is important, and needs to, grieving needs time and it needs all that it needs, and that's a different lecture. But what we found is the people that kind of went into that with a sense of purpose and meaning came through the bereavement and were stronger, and some of them have actually stayed in touch with us and shared their diaries with us and really wanted us to know more about their experiences. And then later on, you know, the drugs improved and some of them are still with us. So this positive affect is important because it built resilience for people. Um, they coexist, and these are just more data, that positive and negative affect are independently related to health, not opposite ends of the continuum. This is a huge survey that was done. Pressman, um, a friend of mine, she was, Karen Pressman got data from Gallup and used those data to, to study. So now the question is, can you change um, can if you you know can we can we manipulate our moods you know what can we do to kind of increase positive affect and there have been some mindfulness based stress reduction studies that have increased positive affect and I'm going to give you some tools that are like those this is this mindful and Alyssa alluded to this and these courses by the way the Osher Center teaches these courses. You can sign up. There's a modest fee for them. They're eight weeks, and you can learn mindfulness-based stress reduction that John Kabat-Zinn has developed. Some of you may have seen uh, Bill Moyer's program on stress many years ago, and um, he interviewed John Kabat-Zinn. That was actually my first experience with mindfulness, was watching that show and seeing this guy named John Kabat-Zinn, who now is a close friend, say, go get a raisin. So I got a raisin. You can do this too at home. And he had you put this raisin in your mouth. So I thought, and I was on an extra cycle. I got off my extra cycle carefully because you're not supposed to leap off extra cycles. Remember that, please. You're supposed to pause for a second and then get off the extra cycle. Um, I got the raisin, and I'm. And he said, just chew, don't swallow it right away. Don't just eat it fast. Eat it really slowly. And he went through this whole thing about being mindful about eating this raisin. And you discover what it's like and that it gets soft and it gets puffy and it, then it kind of disintegrates and it tastes fantastic. And I thought to myself, I've been eating raisins all my life. And this man is teaching me how to eat a raisin. I've got to pay attention to him. Uh, and what he was teaching us was to be mindful. And the whole idea of mindfulness is to reduce stress and enhance well-being. And I'll give you a taste of that tonight. But it was associated not only with decreased stress, but increases in positive affect. There's a lot of programs now in this, but I'm going to share with you the one that Susan Folkman and I developed called Coping Effectiveness Training. It's a little different than mindfulness, and I actually like it better, because mindfulness teaches you to be mindful. And so let's say we're being mindful in this room, and suddenly you know, a fire started we would want to leave the room. Or maybe someone would go see, you know, see if they could find a fire extinguisher and we put out the fire so the building doesn't burn down. We want to problem solve. We could do something about the fire. We don't want to just be mindful and watch the fire as though it was in a fireplace. So I kind of think that there's different types of coping for different types of stressors. So the fire, we want to, if it's something you can change, you should do something about it. Okay, so. Susan Folkman has this, used to be the director of the Osher Center too, which had nothing to do with my getting the position at the Osher Center. I had to compete for that. Um, but she is a dear friend. She has this theory that stress, we have a lot of stress in our lives, but we focus on, you know, if a person is experiencing stress, zero in on what is it that's bothering you. If you ever feel that, like you're suddenly feeling really bothered and you go, what is, what is it, why, what's going on with me right now? Why do I feel kind of like anxious? What is it? 
you know, and you kind of go through the inventory and you go, oh, that's what it is. Or um, some things are changeable and some things were not changeable. And we did this with HIV patients. They couldn't change that they had HIV, but a lot of life is changeable. You know, maybe they need to sort out how they're going to tell people that they have HIV. Maybe they need to work with the insurance company to make sure things are being covered. So for changeable aspects, you want to do problem-focused strategies, like problem-solving or negotiating. You know, and we actually gave everybody the training in getting to yes. And that is the Harvard Negotiation School. It's a little tiny booklet on how to kind of get to win-win with people, trying to find out what is it that you know people really want, and this is what they could be using. Maybe we should buy some copies of that for Congress, you know, and send it off to them, because it's really really good negotiating tools so that everybody kind of comes out getting what they need. And we also taught communication skills, how to communicate, how to get what you need. So we taught them to problem solve. So there's something that was changeable, give people the skills to change it. For things that aren't changeable, this is where we used guided imagery, which is where a person is, is, you know, closes their eyes and you can have a tape or somebody can tell you or you can do it yourself. You have a favorite place that you can go to any time you want. And this is what I do. When I go on vacation, I bring back like a picture or something or postcard of a place that I've been, and I pin it on my desk. And whenever I get really, really upset, I can just kind of go into that picture. And I have to move the picture around. By the way, anything like that, you got to move your pictures around because you get so you don't see it. Like your spouse, they just sort of, there they are by the stapler. Move them over by the scotch tape. And it's like, oh, they look much better over by the scotch tape. And then you move it back to the stapler. It's just a little thing. There's research on that. Trust me. Uh, you just don't see stuff. So I move my little picture around of the lake country in England or wherever I've been lately or where I want to go. I, I'm some of these you see in a movie, you can just make it real. So that's guided imagery. Take, you know, think, and then what you do is you smell the place, you sense the place, you feel the warmth, you, you just you become there. Um, physical activity is also a wonderful way to change mood, by the way. Um, humor is fabulous. It, you know, it, we need a lot of good humor. Um, and then there's also some strategies to enhance well-being, and they include mindfulness. And I'm going to teach you some tonight, and you have them in your handout. And I've taken seven strategies, and I boiled them down to like seven concepts really fast, and then I'm going to zip through some data to show you that this really makes a difference. But I'm using, I came up with this, um, this way to remember it, the word breathe. And so each letter means something. And I'm fine, it's a little tricky, but you'll eventually, I, I can remember it, so maybe you can. B, B is for breathe. But not, breathe like John Kabat-Zinn would breathe, the guy who invented mindfulness. That is be in the moment. So nobody's gonna be looking at you. Just close your eyes. Just breathe, take in a breath. And when you want to, you can exhale and just be here now. Here you are in the class. Push away unwanted thoughts and worry. Just be here. You feel your feet maybe on the floor, maybe they're crossed. Maybe you should put them on the floor. <laughs> um, you know, you can feel your, your body. Just be here now, in the moment. That's really important. And then when you want to just open your eyes, we don't do that enough. Most of us live like worrying about something, we're worried about the future, just trying to be still here and now. That's what meditation is. And you can take a course to learn a lot of it or you can just do it quickly. You can do this at stoplights, you know, just take a breath. You know, sometimes there's nothing you can do, you're caught in traffic. Hey, this is a great time to bring up my B-R-E-A-T-H-E. -E. Breathe, that's the first step. R. Set, now I'm giving you things that will help both problem solving and the other. Realistic goals. I've done a lot of research on coping and what we find is that many people who have stressful lives try to do too much in a certain amount of time. They underestimate the time it's going to take to do things. And it sets them up for constantly failing and being upset with themselves. Um, I am slightly guilty of just grabbing my attache case that has so much in it that I could, if I worked at home for three weeks, I wouldn't get through it. 
And you know, part of that is I don't take the time to take stuff out of there, but that's my New Year's resolution. I'm going to change that behavior and take only what I think I can get done in an evening in kind of whatever's going to be an OK time to spend kind of catching up. And some nights, I'm going to make a promise to myself in the new year that at least twice a week, there'll be nothing. You know, emergencies, yes, but you know, basically not commit that every night I will go home and immediately put in another like five hours. Just not healthy, and I know that. This is my first year in a new job. I've had to do some of that. But set realistic goals for this moment, for this hour. Some of you are probably working on your assignments. Um, most of you aren't texting, which is really nice of you. Um, you know, it's really people can notice. You know. Um, and you can see people in meetings. It's really slightly rude to do this, but you know, go out to dinner with someone and they're texting. Um, but set realistic goals for this moment, for this hour. What can you really do for the vacation? What are you going to do in this? You know, just each period of time. What do I want to get out of today? And then celebrate. Hey, I did it. But be realistic. Most of us aren't. And that's why we're running behind. We're trying to do too much in too little time. It was the classic type A problem. E, everyday events. Notice the positive moments in everyday life. They're around us all the time. I saw some people walking over, and they paused at the Florence Nightingale statue. It's just nice. And it's just beautiful in this area of all the science that's happening around us. And you know, you're, you're just sort of surrounded by all the science. It's just really great. Um, share these events with others. Say, point out to others, you know, oh, isn't it a great day? I love living on the West Coast because you can actually say that to strangers and they don't think you're strange. Um, I was, spent a lot of time in Washington. They don't do that. I discovered that. I had people warn me, don't do that. That's a little weird. I did it anyway because, you know, that's how I am. But um, people were just sort of, what? Did you need something? What you want? What is it? <laughs> I was just saying, have a good day. Did you drop this? Yeah, I dropped it. I'm trying to get rid of it. I'm sorry. In California, we return things to people who drop them. Um, you know, is this a different world? <laughs> Glad to be back. Um, so, you know, but notice what's right. Like, this is a nice room. You know, the meal was good. Um, but, but a lot of times, though, you have to do something a little different. You have to recognize when things go right. Not many of you have really bad colds tonight, I can tell. You know, I notice these things. You know when you have a cold? Don't you ever feel like, if I could just breathe? Oh, whatever. You know when you wake up, you can't breathe on either side? You know, I, I mean, when you can't breathe on one side, you can turn over. And if you use a neti pot, you discover these areas are joined. And then eventually, you know, you can, that one works, but the other one doesn't. And then you, you know, and then it's like, will this ever get better? And then it does, but we don't even notice it. How many of you can breathe right now through fairly well both nostrils? All right, celebrate this moment. You know, what's wrong with you? OK, the tire. Let me tell you about the tire. This is true. I'm not particularly adept at changing tires. I can do it, but they've changed the thingies. <laughs> You know, I, I'm older, so I kind of remembered the jack thing, and there was the thing that had the, you know, to get the cub cap things off, and you got to remember where you put the special locking, whatever it is, gizmo. Remember about that, that when you buy the car, they give you this thing, and you've totally forgotten where it is. Should be in the glove boxes. Where we but anyway, I just don't like to do that. I mean, I'm really bad at that. And I noticed you only need to do that when you need to go somewhere. Isn't that amazing? And you didn't allow 15 minutes, or for some of us a little longer, to get that done. Or you look in the trunk and the other one's not so good. And one in the trunk is really tiny, too. It's like, where is that supposed to go? Anyway, I'm not good at this. And so um, when I go out to my car, every single time, this is true, if you see me in the garage, you will see this, I am checking my tires and I'm going, yes, it's a great day. <laughs> And I do this. It's sort of a fun thing. I just, I look, and there's one of my tires. I have this, like, sort of little sensitive tire. The one, I don't know what you call it, but it's the one, like, by the driver. Is it right or left? I don't know, but it's on the driver's side in the front part. He doesn't like to let the tire suck up close to the rim. He's not flat. He just doesn't stick on well. And so he leaks. I have a leaking guy. So I, I, what I do is I fill him every two weeks at Costco. You can go, and you get the guys, and they help you. So I am thrilled when he's doing well, and my other, the other guys, they're all guys. They're all doing really well, and I'm thrilled. So I'm telling you, you can do this too. Um, another one, let me go back. Another one, just really good one, the mail. When you get the mail, you go, 
nothing from the IRS. This is great, because when it is from the IRS, is this a bad day, usually? Is it Friday? Almost always. Why is that? So it ruins your weekend. OK, this is what you got to do. I mean, this is life. OK, acts of kindness. Create positive events for others. Uh, the best one, I'm going to run late. I can't run late. Um, acts of kindness. It, you, there's a wonderful ad on television, those who watch television, where it's, it, there's a feed forward where someone sees someone else do something, like a ball rolls in the street, and a lady sees someone pick it up, and then they do an act of kindness. This is my new thing. If we could all do acts of kindness, other people would see us doing acts of kindness, and they would do acts of kindness. And it's just fabulous. And there is a group in the East Coast where they, they have random acts of kindness, and they carry on these little cards. We could get that. You Xerox these little cards. And if somebody leaves their lights on, but most people lock their doors. But if they don't, you can turn out their lights and just put a little card down. I turned out the lights for you. You know, or I found your address book, and I tucked it on the wheel, you know, your rear wheel. Please see this note. Um, but little things that you can do for people. One I do is that I go to the grocery store, and I often have a small basket. And at my grocery store, there are a lot of families. And there are single moms and dads and people with kids. And I'm there at around 6.30. This is late for kids to be getting home. And kids get really, really you know, fussy when they're tired and hungry and all of that. And so here are these moms with the kids trying to go buy the candy. And it's just a disaster. And I just let them in. And it is so amazing because they have big baskets. Sometimes they have little cars with kids. But they have these big baskets and tons of stuff. And I've got a little basket. And I go, you go ahead. And it's so amazing because there's a rule that big baskets let little baskets in, but little baskets don't let big baskets in. We don't do that. You know. By the way, I've even been attacked once because I had my little basket. And somebody told me I was in the wrong line because they counted every orange that was in the bag of oranges. Excuse me. I let the person go first, and then the next little basket let me stay in the 15 last line. It was really sort of interesting dynamic. That was on the East Coast. That wouldn't happen here. Um, anyway, um, so the basket thing is you let them in, and everybody around is just like, they can't believe it. They go, Good Samaritan on aisle three. You know, it's just the greatest thing. So look for opportunities to do kind things. It's fabulous. Turn negatives around. I mentioned that sad things happen, and they do. Um, but sometimes, and it's important to talk about that, be there, respect that, and it's real. But there are also times to sort of take that moment and say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do something. I, I'm going to make this. A, a friend of mine's mom died, and I was talking with her about this. And I'll share the story. It stayed with me for like 20 years. She said, someone maybe told her, I don't know, she said, my mom always wrote thank you notes. And you know what I'm going to do for the rest of my life, whenever somebody does something for me? I'm going to sit down and write a thank you note right away. And, she, and I said, you, that's a great idea. And I said, how can you make that like real now? And we talked about how the next day she would go to like one of these nice stores and buy a few boxes of really nice cards you know, that just she could, so she'd be ready. And it was a way of doing something that she, and so for the rest of her life, she's done this. Well, it, what was interesting is she told me about it, and I'm really trying to be better about thank you notes, too. So finding something about a person that's gone and then doing part of what they did can become a way of having them live on. And it was just sort of still staying with it. Well, there are other people. A wonderful friend of mine had breast cancer, and she didn't like how she was treated in the hospital. You know, it was very surgical, if you will. And so she has, and her husband, this is Penny and Bill George, and in his, his book, Authentic Leadership, he wrote that book. Um, his first pair, the whole first chapter is about how Penny got breast cancer, and it changed his life. He teaches business at Harvard Law, uh, Business School, and he was the CEO for Medtronic. They actually fund NPR and that Sunday afternoon program on spiritual, spirituality as part of this whole thing. It was all from her breast cancer. They want to change how medicine is practiced. And they have just funded us to start an integrative women's health program. We're going to create a model of what does it mean to have integrative women's health. And Penny just decided she would do She called me up and said, do you have something you'd like to do in, women, in integrative health? It was anything I wanted. And thinking about Penny, I thought, this is what I want to do. But she's devoting her life to that. And others have done that. Michael J. Fox, 
He could have gone off and hidden. He has Parkinson's. He has found, found that he created this foundation. They've raised $221 million for Parkinson's research. Plus, he goes on Jay Leno, and he's, he's Michael J. Fox, and he's right there being Michael with courage, and, because we all have, some of us have our, our challenges that others can't see. Sometimes you can see the challenge, but he's turned it into something that has taught us so much. So that's turn negatives into something positive, if you can. And that, again, is not to detract from the negative. H is honor your strengths. Each one of you has something special about yourself. You play the clarinet really well, or whatever it is. Just when you're alone, stay close to those things that you value in yourself. And you know, it's OK to say, I'm good at that. I like doing it. I sing in the car. You know, I like singing in the car. It cheers me up, and I'm OK. I used to sing, and some people would even listen. Probably not anymore, but you know, I did it then, and it's OK. And I have fun with it. In fact, this cop was looking at me, thinking that I was talking on the cell phone. I could tell. And I was, I was just singing. So I rolled my window, and I said, just singing in the car. <laughs> OK, um, east, not East Coast, not East Coast, West Coast, <laughs> E. And some of you are from the East Coast, I'm so sorry. You know, it's OK. Um, there were great things, great history, great brick buildings. Um, <laughs> Monticello. Uh, OK, um, I can think of some others. Give me some time. Lightning bugs. Remember, have you guys seen those? The ones in this dusk in the June? These little bugs come out and they blink. It's great. Um, you put them in jars, punch holes, or anyway. Um, e is end each day with gratitude. Uh, that means note the good things that happened today. You came to this lecture, you laughed. All the things that you're thankful for. Most of us get to the end of the day and we go, oh, no, I still didn't get that. What is wrong with me? Where's that piece of paper? Oh, why don't I keep a piece of paper by the bed? Oh, and scratch it down. Oh, I'll remember it first thing in the morning. This is just terrible. Like, you know, not good. This is no way to go to bed unless you hit yourself hard enough you fall asleep. You know, um, you want to say, this is a good day. It was fun. I, you know, I, I caught up. I, I did 10,000 steps. I did eight. I did more than yesterday. Think of those things, and you'll sleep better. It's what we discovered. This is the only thing, by the way, when we went to look at positive mental health and what you could do, this was the only thing I could find in the literature way back when that um, the people that have worked with Beck had something about positive accounting at the end of the day. And now we would encourage people to keep a gratitude diary. OK. So those are your B-R, I'm losing track, B-R-E-A-T-H-E. -E. Um, we have a scale in our studies so we can measure whether or not we were able to enhance personal growth. I love these questions. I learned to be open to new information. I learned to find more meaning in life. I learned to, to be myself and not try to be what others want me to be. We did a big randomized trial. We taught people to cope more effectively compared to our control group. The coping group is on the left. The, uh, excuse me, the, the coping group is on the left, the control group is on the right in terms of being able to cope and have efficacy doing it. We significantly increased people's scores on the positive states of mind scale. Uh, unfortunately, our control group got worse. Um, <laughs> Not good. I'm sorry. We quickly gave them some information. The personal growth scale, I just saw you. Huge increases. Again, the control group is slipping a little. Not good. Um, this is the most interesting thing of, our, of the findings. And that is that a lot of people, you do these studies, you reduce depression, and then after the three months of the intervention, and you're in the follow-up, it doesn't maintain. Um, you help people quit smoking, they do it for three months, and then it doesn't maintain. People lose weight three months, and then they slip back. We have never, ever seen anything like this, where you change to behavior, and if anything, the coping skills enhanced. The positive states of mind are holding. The, the control group actually was getting a little bit of, so we started doing some support for them so that, you know, just because I was worried about the controls. Um, but we've never seen data like this. I mean, this is just so aberrant. Um, here's the personal growth scale. There was a peak, and then they started to slip, but then they're, start, they're holding. And I want to ask you, what do you think is holding it? My guess, but we need to do study, is the social support that they've started to be more positive, and it changes the way others respond to them. 
and there's a feed forward. And so that you, you can just sort of, you get on a roll and you start to be able to doing kind things for other people and then they do kind things back to you. And there's this wonderful feed forward. So this is the case I tried to make. There are pathways by which positive emotions are associated with health and well-being. They're not the inverse of negative. We're, we're blessed with this ability to feel and have empathy across the spectrum. Uh, positive emotional states can be increased and it's maintained. And I've given you some tools that you can use. And just to reflect on the class, with integrative medicine, this, this idea of integrating all of these other areas of medicine, the diet, the exercise, the mind, body, spirit, through science, we're going to develop, and we are developing an evidence base, as you see. And our goal is to facilitate integra integration of effective strategies to enhance health so you can age with vitality, as Ellen described, have healthy families, healthy diets, and manage stress. Our goal is to, it, at the center and in working with everyone, is to go beyond returning people to just not being sick. We want more than that. I want, our goal is to strive to encourage personal growth and enhanced well-being. That's what coming to UCSF should do. Not just get rid of an illness, but give you that resilience to encourage you to actively participate in choices that would enhance your resilience. And we know that positive affect does that. It will enhance your immune system, prevent illness, so enhance resilience, prevent illness, and improve the quality of our, all of our lives. Thank you so, so very much. How are you doing? You guys, too kind. I have time for questions, and I will try to repeat the questions. If you have questions or tell stories, you can share with me, you know, thoughts you've had, not just tonight, but across the, the nights. And if you're leaving early, please, you can sneak up and get yourself a pedometer if you need to. Um, any questions or comments? Yes, the lady in the back and then this lady here. She just shared how she's been keeping a gratitude um, diary for the last two and a half weeks and is seeing that it lifts her mood at the end of the day to just remember that there were good things, noticing the things that have gone well. Thank you, that's great. There was a comment here in the front? Yes. Very good question. Have we been able to insinuate some of these perspectives of integrative medicine and being mindful and caring for others um, is part of medical training. And the integrative, the, the Osher Center for Integrative Medicine actually has. We have um, six required units in medical school that they all have to take now that expose them to some of this information because all physicians need to know about certain parts of integrative medicine. We also have 20 some elective units, including mindfulness training and and activities like that that they can elect to have. Um, they're welcome also to come over to the Osher Center and do shadowing. So they shadow the physicians at the Osher Center and the practitioners do acupuncture, massage. The physicians do an integrative interview with you. It's a longer visit um, that we're able to do at the Osher Center. And so the students can come and shadow that. And at the Osher Center, we do teach them yoga and mindfulness. And so we have medical students that do that. UCSF is unique in that they're all the, the students in the School of Medicine, Nursing, Pharmacy, and a, a dental school have organized their own integrative medicine interest group. And they, they have their own day-long meeting that they put on in the spring here. So it, it's a growing field of interest. And so I think you'll see more and more of this with younger physicians, um, older ones, you know, would need to seek it out some, and some do. But you're right, I mean, I, we've all experienced people that could use some mindfulness. They need to get that raisin right away. <laughs> we just get, take this raisin, I want you to try this raisin and see if it changes your life. I have thanked John, by the way, for that. Um, questions or comments? Yes, sir. Yes, 
He's saying he's from Malawi, it's a, um, an area in Africa where it's small and everyone knows everyone, so they're, em they're embraced in support and there's very little depression. The, um, there are areas in the United States, there's certain religious orders, the Amish in particular, where um, they've done studies and there are pockets of people that live that kind of a life where there's extended families. You know, we've lost something with the way that we live. And I think that there are ways we can recreate that by creating community. The one thing I kind of regret about this class is that I think some of you might like each other, but there's there's no way to kind of have you meet. You know, and I, I there's no like, you know, coffee hour or something, and even that's a little awkward. But we we need more ways as adults and as you know individuals to be able to get to know one another without the other person wondering why you're doing that. And you can do that through organizations. But remember, in college, I mean, you sort of just met people, and then as you move away from that, it gets harder and harder uh, to to meet people. I and mean, there are some places, you know, Starbucks. <laughs> The Marina Safeway, uh, but usually <laughs> Sierra Club clubs are a good way. But it's but it's but there's nothing like the family, you know. Families are, and I think some of you, I hope some of you were able to have a chosen family or some family in Thanksgiving, because it makes a difference. Other comments or questions? Yes, I could share some interesting pieces of information with you. Um, the Osher Center. Uh, wasn't dealing with that. I think it's important to sometimes have both male and female physicians, for example, because some people want to be able to talk to someone of opposite or the same gender. When I, Ellen Hughes used to be there and she's not there and we had no women. We have corrected that since I've been there. We've added children and we've added women physicians. But I, I think that um, we aren't doing research on that. There is interesting research on stress. And what if? And I'll just share. There are gender differences. I have actually. I've, I'm in this part of the women's movement, so I sort of wanted to downplay those, and they do kind of keep creeping up on you. And it's. But there are some really interesting ones. I'll share one. Stress in monkeys. They were trying to stress monkeys so that they could study stress and heart disease. And because monkeys develop heart disease like humans do, but very quickly. So they fed the monkeys. First they saw what would happen. And you know how they stress male monkeys? What they do is these are somologous macaques. They're the little kind of cute guys. They would introduce a new male into the big cage. And monkeys have a hierarchy. And they have to figure out who's going to be the top monkey. It's called the alpha male. And they, they all kind of fuss. Most of it's fake fussing, by the way. There's a lot of threat and things that they do. And then they reestablish the hierarchy. But while the hierarchy is being reestablished, it's incredibly stressful for male monkeys. And what they did was they could then show that that kind of stress increased the heart disease rate in the monkeys. Then they fed them a high-fat diet. And they used the same kind of fat that McDonald's used um, to cook French fries in. And when they put the two together, they, this study was only done once and very quickly because it was so clear. The monkeys just died. I mean, it's so, when you put the fat together with the stress of reorienting themselves, then that just, you know, it was really, really bad, particularly for the second tier monkey. The top monkey does okay. But the, so it was a really interesting thing. They tried to do this with female monkeys, and it didn't work at all. They put all the female monkeys, they introduce more females in, and they, oh, it's good, and more women, and they, lay, and they share their food, and it just a disaster. They couldn't figure out how to stress the females. Um, and it was really interesting, and then they discovered the one thing that worked for females, isolation. You take the female monkey, and you put her in a cage alone, and it's just the whole thing falls apart. Totally different, totally different. Really, really, it was so amazing, you know, and, and what would happen is the female monkeys don't develop heart disease as rapidly as the male monkeys, but with their periods would get thrown off, all their biochemistry, everything would just sort of not do well. It's just, that's just one gender. So there's a lot that we could learn about genders, and we can learn from genders, and there probably is a reason that males and females were meant in most cases, to kind of live together because they are, these are really complementary types of skills, skill sets. I studied primates. It was a really interesting experience um, in, in Russia. And we went out to this call, place called the Gumista. And this was kind of interesting. I was with 
um, as a woman scientist, there weren't as many women as men. So I was with uh, six men. And we're out going out to the Gumistan. You had to go across this river on this rope thing. And we're there. And, and they're, they're free-ranging baboons, hundreds of them. And they're scary. And it was really interesting how, while I was there, and I didn't even notice I was doing this, but we were all sort of standing around. And all of a sudden, I kind of noticed that I was in the middle. I, you know, and I'm, you know, I'm strong, I'm tough, you know, really tough. And I was in the middle, and my guy friends had all sort of turned their back to me. And they were talking amongst themselves, and they had created a circle around me. It was not perfect, but it was really interesting. It was just all of a sudden I noticed, and that I was very comfortable. Because I was really not, it, I was, it was very, it was not safe. The situation was not a good situation. And so we were doing exactly what horses do. And it was just sort of really, it just sort of happened. And then we commented on it. And it was like, oh, we all got embarrassed and quickly rearranged ourselves. But it was, there are these things. And it's, you know, there are books written about it. And I would love the Osher Center to do more research on that. But we first had to get some more women physicians, and we now have women physicians. We just got two new fellows for next year, uh, one that will focus on obstetrics and gynecology, and the other one who wants to bring integrative medicine to the underserved. And we've now partnered with San Francisco General Hospital and are opening an Osher clinic at the General. So a lot happening. It's late. Let's take one more. And I'll stay for other comments or questions, but I need to get pedometers to everyone. Any other last comment or question? Thank you all so, so very much. <laughs>